Welcome to session 30 of the study of John's Gospel. In today's session, we're going to look at chapter 14 of John's Gospel, beginning at the 15th verse, and concluding this day with verse number 31 at the conclusion of chapter 14. Now, we remembered in the first 14 verses of chapter 14, Jesus began the chapter by saying, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Well, there seems to be still confusion among the disciples, and Jesus told them that he's going to prepare a place for them. And Thomas, one of the twelve, said to him, Lord, where are you, go where are you going? We don't know the way to where you are going. And then Jesus said those famous words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, as we continue now in chapter 14, we want to pick up at verse 15. And what I'm going to ask you to do right now is I want you to read verses 15 through 17. Just three short verses. But these verses are incredibly powerful. Focus on each one of those verses. Think through them very carefully. Underline things that you think are important to you. And then we will come back in a few moments and we will discuss those verses. So, read 15 through verse 17 of John 14. Now, I hope as you read some of those verses, they jumped out at you and they truly just grabbed hold of you as you read them. Now, remember, this is the continuing conversation Jesus is having with Philip as that discussion begins in verse 8 of chapter 14. Now, let me read 12 through 14 again. I know we're at 15, but I want to connect those verses to verse 15. Jesus says in verse 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, here's verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. We're going to stop there for a moment. Now, as Jesus continued his discussion in chapter 14, he looked at Philip, the other disciples there a while. Now, remember, Judas is gone. He's off working his betrayal. Jesus says, if you love me. Now, that word love right there is the Greek word agape. It was a powerful word that was used, and that word literally had little connection with emotional love. It, it, it really was connected, if you love me, it was an act of the will, and the act of the will to love was to give of oneself in service for another, no matter what the circumstances are, or no matter who the person is. So Jesus is saying very clearly, if you love me, if you want to serve me, if you will give everything, for me, and this is what he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We've talked about in chapter 13 in previous sessions about the commandments. Not only did the Jews have the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses at Mount Sinai, but they also had what they called 603 other commandments that they said they found in Genesis through Deuteronomy for a total of six. 113 commandments. But in chapter 13, Jesus had clarified the new commandment that we were to love one another just as he has loved us. We are to love one another. So that's what Jesus is talking about. He is continuing this teaching what it is to love him, love God, and to love and serve others as well. But Jesus also knows that that is very difficult for all of us to do. We can say it, that we love God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind. We can say that we want to love and serve our neighbor as we love and serve ourselves. But Jesus knows as that's incredibly difficult. And that's why he says next 
in verse 16 these words. And I will ask the Father. Now remember, he and the Father are of one substance. They're joined together. There's an intimate connection between them, as Jesus has been talking about throughout chapter 13 and now through 14. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. And now we are being introduced to the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity. We have the Father, of course the Son, and now we're introduced to the Helper, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity. And now, Jesus says that this Helper, the Holy Spirit, will be with you, meaning the disciples, but also with us forever. Look at 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So not only is there a connection with the Father and the Son with us, that the Father joins himself to us, the Son has joined himself to us, now Jesus says the Spirit joins himself to us. So think about it. The entire Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, dwells within you and within me and within all believers. He is the spirit of truth. He is the helper, and he will be with us forever. So now at this point, Jesus is introducing to the disciples and to us, now the third person of the Trinity, the helper, the spirit of truth, the one that will always be with us and walks with us forever. And not only that, dwells with us throughout our lives. So I'm going to ask you now to think that through very carefully in what it possibly means for you, for other believers, for the church as well. Now I'm going to ask you to stop the video in a few seconds here and read verses 18 through 24. Read verses 18 to 24. Again, as you've done before, underline things that are important to you. Ask yourself questions. Talk to Jesus as he's speaking here as well. And we will come back in a few moments and clarify and discuss verses 18 to 24. Well, you've read 18 through 24, I hope. Verses 18 through 20, I just want to read them right now. And I, I want you to listen again to these words because here Jesus is taking us again to the cross, but also to the resurrection. Listen to what he writes, or what he says, excuse me. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. His crucifixion, he will die. But then he goes on and says this, but you will see me. The resurrection. Then he says this, because I live, you also will live. Because of his resurrection, new creation has come into this world, new life will be given not only to the disciples, but to all of his followers. And then in verse 20, Jesus says the following, In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Finally it will be in the resurrection of Jesus. They will finally begin to piece this all together. It will still take some time. It will take through Pentecost, 40 or 50 days after his resurrection, 40 days after the resurrection, 10 days before Pentecost was the ascension when he goes to the right hand of the Father. It will take time for them to put all these pieces together. It's like putting together a thousand piece puzzle. But when finally it comes together, you go, wow. And this is what Jesus is saying to the disciples again. Let's go back to 18. I will not leave you as orphans, meaning he knows when in a few hours he's going to be arrested and all the events are going to take place and the disciples are going to watch him die on the cross. Even though it would be at a distance, they would see him die. But then, three days later, they will again confront him with the power of his bodily resurrection. And he says he will always be with them. It will be in the resurrection, through the ascension, and also through the day of Pentecost, and all those little visits between 
Jesus' resurrection and ascension, that they will finally come to grips with what all this truly means. But now, look at 21, verse 21. Jesus says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, we're back again in verse 13 about the new commandment, in, er, in, chapter, in chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He continues to come back to this. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now again, this is not works righteousness, where you do something to earn God's love and favor and forgiveness. They're already the sons of God. We're the sons of God as well. And what we do now is we work because we love Jesus. We love God the Father. We love the Holy Spirit because all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, dwell within us. We do our best. We try to keep those commandments by loving God and loving and serving neighbor. But that's why Jesus says, I'm sending you the helper to help you do what you cannot fully do on your own. That's what this is about. Now, verse 22, Judas. Now again, John has to clarify, and in parentheses, not Iscariot. Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, is already gone. Judas, not Iscariot, said to Jesus, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Meaning, how are you going to make yourself known to us, but not to the world? They haven't come to grips with death and resurrection yet. And of course they wouldn't have come to grips with it yet. Because every Jew knows, as we talked about earlier, every Jew knows that when you die, you die. But Jesus is preparing them, not only for Good Friday, but also for Easter morning. Because right now we're on Monday, Thursday. The next day is Good Friday, as we call it. And then by that Sunday, Easter, they will come to grips with the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Now look at what Jesus responds in verse 23. Jesus answered, Judas, not Iscariot, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and we will come to make our home with him. He's back to that same theme again about loving God, about loving him by how? Keeping his word, meaning his commandments. Verse 24, whoever does not love does not keep my words. And, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. You cannot love and say you love God by not loving and serving your fellow human being. It's impossible. I would always tell my confirmation kids, or I would always ask them, excuse me, I would say this, how do you love the God you cannot see? Now, they would come up with all sorts of answers, going to church, praying, so on and so forth. And I'd let them talk for a few minutes. And then I would ask them again, how do you love the God you cannot see? And then I would give them the answer, by loving the neighbor you do see. I cannot say I love God and hate my neighbor. It's impossible because Jesus has connected the love of God with the love and service of neighbor. So I can't say I love God and hate my neighbor. That's something that all of us must think through in perilous times, especially in the year 2020, in which the year this video is being videoed. Is the year 2020 with COVID 19, with the unrest in our country, the United States? We have been called to love God as we love and serve our neighbor, no matter who neighbor is. And that's a challenge. That's a huge challenge. And that's why we need the helper. That's why Jesus speaks these words, because he knows how difficult it's going to be, not only for us in the year 2020, but back in the first century when Rome turned against them, but also when the Jewish authorities went after them to still love God by loving and serving your neighbor. So again, how do you love the God you cannot see? By loving and serving the neighbor you do see. 
And that's why we all desperately need the helper, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, who will dwell within us forever. Now, I'm going to ask you to read 25 verses 25 through 31. 25 through 31. Again, underline, ask questions, think about it very carefully, take your time with it. And in a few moments, we will come back and we will discuss verses 25 through 31. So, read them carefully. Jesus knows the time is now getting short. He will be arrested soon because he'll be heading to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he knows he needs to continue to instruct the disciples, the 11 of them that are still there. In verse 25, Jesus says the following, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. He continues to prepare them for the events that are going to fall into place in the next hours. Now, they have no concept of him dying, though he's been talking about it, but they cannot grasp this idea that he's going to die and suffer because it made no sense to them. They honestly believed and trusted that he was the promised Messiah, and the Jews had all been taught, including the disciples, that the Messiah does not die. He rules. He reigns. He delivers them from their enemies. They just cannot come to grips with this. And that's why, once again, Jesus says to them, These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you. Now look at verse 26. This is one of my favorite verses of trying to help the people I've taught over the years to understand the work of the Holy Spirit. Now listen to what Jesus says, verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. So let's stop there for a moment. The entire Trinity is mentioned here. The Holy Spirit, the Father, and Jesus. For those who continue to say the Trinity isn't mentioned, well, maybe the word Trinity is not used in Scripture. That's true. But there is no mistake that the concept of the Trinity fills the pages of the New Testament, especially this Gospel of St. John. Look at 26 again, verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. There's the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, spelled out. Pick it up again. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Many have asked, how in the world did the gospel writers remember all the words and teachings of Jesus? Well, there's your answer. The Holy Spirit. We have always stated that the scripture from Genesis through Revelation is inspired by God inspired by the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts and in the minds of individuals. And this is how it was done. From Genesis through Revelation, the Holy Spirit is calm and reminded the authors of Holy Scripture all that God has said, all that God has done, and what God will continue to do. And that's how we get the words of Jesus. And that's why we can be confident when we read these words in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the way through the New Testament, all the way from Genesis to Malachi, really from Genesis to Revelation, that this is the Word of God, that the Holy Spirit has His hand upon it. And we can be confident that these are the words of God. And when people say to us, well, those are just words of men, we can smile. We can say, yes, men did write these words, but they were guided by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if they go, where does it say that? Point them to this verse. Back to John 14, verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, 
He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He will remind the disciples. But also, he reminds us as well through the power of the written word. The Holy Spirit is still working in our lives, reminding us over and over and over all that Jesus said and all that Jesus did through his suffering and death on the cross, through his resurrection, through the visits after the resurrection, all the way to the ascension to the right hand of the Father and the promise of Jesus coming again. The Holy Spirit is working and working and working in you and me and all believers to continue to remind us and point us always back to Jesus. The Holy Spirit isn't here to do his own work. And even Jesus said he wasn't here to do his own work. He was here to do the work of the Father. And now the Spirit comes to remind us of the work of Jesus, the things that Jesus said and Jesus did, because they are the works of God the Father. This is how all this works. And so I wanted to just put that in your minds today that you can be confident when you read Holy Scripture that it is the Word of God inspired by the work of the Holy Spirit to bring to remembrance the authors, be it in the Old Testament, of all the works and promises of God, but also now in the New, all the works and the promises of our Lord Jesus. So keep verse 26 right in here. Keep it in your minds because that verse is powerful. And anytime you may have doubt, anytime you will struggle, anytime you will question, go back to that verse and remind yourself that the Bible, all 66 books, are inspired by God through the Holy Spirit. And they are, these are the words of God. And so remember that these words are for you and me. Now, we pick up at verse 27. Jesus continues and says the following Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. The peace of God, which passes all human understanding, is given by Jesus. However, this peace, Jesus said, is very important. Look at what he says now in the middle of 27. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let me read it again. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And then he said it again. Look at verse, back to 14.1. He says it here. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You see, for the world, peace is the absence of violence in some way. The peace of God is far, far different. It really connects us to say that you and I, by the works of Jesus, are at peace now with God. I know this is difficult for many of us to understand, but before we were brought to faith, before Jesus into our, entered our lives, before the Father joined himself, joined himself to us, and before the Holy Spirit works in us and dwells in us, we, as sinful men and women, were enemies of God. St. Paul picks up on this as well. But you and I now are at peace with God, no matter what is going around or going on in the world around us, whatever it is. We are at peace with God. And that's why today, and I believe today as I'm recording this, is July 21st, 2020. And all that's going on in our country today with COVID-19, with all the riots going on in the anarchy and all of the craziness that seems to be going on in our country and even in our state and maybe even in our local communities. We can be confident of something. We are at peace with the creator of the universe. It might appear that things are raging all around us and there's no peace going on in this world, but we can be confident that we are at peace with Almighty God. So now, I want you to think that through right here. Look at verse 27 again. Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. 
not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Verse 28. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now, again, he's talking about his death. He's talking about going to the Father. He's been preparing them for this from the beginning of his ministry. Because Jesus knew from day one what the outcome was going to be. Now, I know some would deny that and some reject that. But he knew from day one of his ministry what the, his outcome would eventually be. It is the cross. And he was preparing his disciples to grapple with it and to understand it as well. And so now, look at this verse again, middle of 28. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. In his human nature, Jesus lived in subjection to his Father. Though they were of the same substance, Jesus lived in subjection to the Father, to honor him, to obey him. You see, Jesus is fully human, and yet, at the same moment, he's fully divine, as we call the God-man, 100% divine, 100% human. But in that human nature, as he walked on this earth, as he did his ministry, he lived in obedience to his Father and was subjected to him. And that's what he wanted the disciples to know. Because the outcome of that will be for us, is we too are to live in subjection to God the Father as well, and also to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's pick up at verse 29. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. You know what he's talking about. He's talking about his death on the cross. Verse 30. I will no longer talk much with you. Now watch this next verse. For the ruler of this world is coming. Satan is coming. The devil is coming after him in every way possible. But listen to what Jesus says. Here also is incredible good news. Jesus says, he, meaning the ruler of the world, the devil, he has no claim on me. He doesn't rule me. He's coming after me. But he doesn't rule me and has no claim on me. Verse 31, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Everything about the cross. Everything about the cross is to be in obedience to his Father. And it's in the cross event that Jesus will show his incredible love for God and for all human beings. And that includes you and me as well. Everything now, everything is focused from the beginning of his ministry all the way to this point on Monday, Thursday. Everything is preparing everyone for the events that will take place on Good Friday and that cross. Now listen to the last sentence of chapter 14. Rise, let us go from here. However, he will continue to teach in chapter 15 and chapter 16. And then in chapter 17, he will have the incredible, what we call the high priestly prayer, where he prays to the Father for you and me, for all the creation, for all that will happen. So I'm going to ask you now to go back and read chapter 14 all the way through, but also prepare for our next session. And I would ask you to read chapter 15. Verses 1 through 17. Verses 1 through 17 of chapter 15. So, until next time, may God continue to bless you always.